Hey everyone, welcome to a new tutorial. Today we are recreating the mechanics of the glintstone arc from Elden Ring. We will not focus on visuals. If you want some variations as well as a more close visual representation of the arc, then consider becoming a patron and gaining access to these files as well as over 25 other ones. Without any further ado, let's jump right into it. First thing we will need is a 3D model of an arc shape for our collider. We're going to create it real quick, and remember you can make whatever shape you want. We will focus on the arc here. If you don't want to follow through with this part, then I will leave a link in the description for you to download the arc.fvx file we create now. Let's delete the camera and light. Press 1 to go in front view, then switch over to edit mode. I used to have to do it, but you can also go up here and select the edit mode. While you have your cube selected, press S to scale and X to scale on the X axis. Holding Ctrl, press R to create loops on your mesh. If you scroll up or down, it will increase the amount of loops. Ok, this looks fine. Switch over to wireframe mode. I have a hotkey that pops up this menu, but if you don't, you can go up here and select wireframe. Press B to box select the middle vertices and then up here enable proportional editing and press G to move these vertices. Using your mouse scroll wheel increase or lower its radius then press Z to lock it on the Z axis and move it up until you get the shape that you want. This looks fine to me. I'm going to disable proportional editing and shrink it on the Y axis. Ok, this is good enough. Switch over to Object Mode and Solid View. Go down here to Object Data Properties and add a Shape Key Basis. This is the main shape of your mesh. Then add another Shape Key and this will act as the stretching of our mesh. So, while you have this Shape Key selected, go into Edit Mode, press A to select your whole mesh and scale it on the X axis like this. Ok, good enough. You can go back to object mode and you will see it return to its original shape, but if you change this value over here, it goes to the stretch version. This is exactly what we want for our collider, to stretch over time. I'm going to quickly rename it arc and export it as an fbx file. Inside Unity I have set up my project with a ground plane, an fps controller and some enemies. Let's start off by importing the model we just created. Under the import settings, click model and uncheck convert units. Make sure import plane shapes is checked out. Enable read write, generate colliders and click apply. Drag this model into your scene and you will notice that you cannot see it. That is because it is massive. Under transform, set its scale to 1 rather than 100 and reset its rotation on the x axis. It should now be facing the blue axis, which is your forward direction. Ok, great. Under Mesh Collider, enable Convex and its trigger. Under Skin Mesh Render, you should be able to see your shape key and modify it. Ok, nice. Leave it at 0 and add a new component of type C -sharp script called Glintstone Arc. Open the script with your programming software of choice and let's code it. We will begin by setting up our variables. A boolean to bake the mesh if we want to a public array of type string for our enemy tags or whatever this will be interacting with, a float for movement speed, damage, distance, scale time and shape time to control our animation curves. Down here add two public animation curves. We also need a few more floats that will change inside our code. Travel distance to calculate how far we've gone, transform scale, shape key value, and two timers to control the animation curves a vector 3 to store our span position, the render, collider, and a list to store all the enemies we have already hit, to avoid hitting an enemy more than once. Inside start, we assign the render, collider, and we also set the spawn position to be this transform current position and lastly, set its scale to 0 so that we can increase it over time later. Inside update, we assign the travel distance to be the value between the spawn position and the current position of this transform, then below it, we check if the travel distance is bigger than the distance we simply destroy this game object. This is to avoid having it travel forever and ever and ever. 
Below this, we use translate to move our arc forward over time using the move speed variable. For the animation curves, we need to have a value go from 0 to 1. The way we will achieve this is by simply increasing these floats we created earlier every frame using a public float which we can assign in the inspector later. Great! Now that we have the curve value going up over time, we can set the transform scale variable to be the scale curve evaluate and pass on this variable. Evaluate will always take in a value from 0 to 1. Now do the same for the shape key. One more thing you have to do to the shape key value is multiply it by 100. Because we are getting a value from 0 to 1 and shape key values go from 0 to 100. So we have to multiply. We can now apply these values. First one we will do is scale. We need to convert the transform scale variable from a float to a vector 3. We can very easily do this like this. And now you just set the scale. For the shape key we use the render and set blend shape weight. 0 because it is the first shape key we have and then pass on the shape key value. For the collider we first check if we have enabled bake mesh. So if the bake mesh is true we create a new mesh, bake it and assign it to our collider. This way whenever we morph our mesh using the shape keys the collider will always be the same shape as our mesh. Okay. Done with the update. Now go down here and add a on trigger enter. Check if our array of enemy tags to check contains whatever our trigger collided with. This will give you an error and that is because we need to go up here and add using system.link. Head back down here and the error should be gone. On top of checking its tag we also need to check if whatever our trigger has hit is not in our enemy's attack list then here you will damage your enemies. Of course, I do not know how you handle damaging enemies in your game, but I have set up this very simple example. This is my enemy script. It has a public function called damage that it takes in a parameter of type float, and we use this to lower the health, and if it is zero or below zero, then we simply destroy the game object. Very simple. So, the way I will damage enemies in this example is by first assigning the enemy script to a temporary variable and then check if we have actually assigned the enemy script in which case we can call the damage function and add this transform to our list of attack enemies to avoid attacking it twice. Let's take a quick look how I am currently spawning this arc. Inside my player controller I have added a public variable of type game object called arc prefab. Then inside my update I check if I have pressed mouse 0 which is left mouse click and if so we create the prefab at the camera's position using the camera's rotation because, remember, our arc will always move forward over time, so it is very important that we spawn it with the right orientation. Let's head back into Unity. The first thing we have to check is if we want to bake the mesh. This is for optimization purposes. If we take a look at these variations I made, they're all baking the mesh at runtime. However, this Phoenix guy has a much more complex mesh and this makes it very taxing on your computer. So the best practice will be to just uncheck this and give it like a sphere collider or something else. Right, so for enemy tags to check I will add one and call it enemy. Because my enemy's tag is called enemy. Move speed to 3 damage 10, distance 10, scale time I will set it to 1 and shape time to something very low so that it morphs shape very slowly. Now you can start playing with the curves to get them to morph into your shape keys however you want. These are the values in my variations. I will rename this arc prefab then drag it into my project folder to create a original prefab. In my player controller, I need to assign this prefab so that we can create it whenever we press the left mouse. Hit play and let's check it out. Nice, it gets wider and wider. That is exactly what we wanted. Now go mess around with some of its values, change the mesh to something cooler, I don't know, go crazy with it. Thank you guys for watching, thanks to my patrons for making these videos possible and I will see you in the next video.